Good morning, church. <clears throat> I'd like to add my welcome to the one that was already extended this morning and say just how good it is to see the family of God here worshiping the Almighty together. I'd also like to say if you are visiting with us, we're obviously glad to have your presence and would like to make sure that you get one of our little welcome bags in the back uh, before you leave this morning. It's not much, but it's just a token of our appreciation and something our RISE group, our um, like kindergarten to fifth grade group, helped put together uh, just to say thank you for being here. Uh, I would also like to encourage you to come back tonight. Uh, Brother Clint mentioned the young men of the youth group are leading the service, and that's, that's always a bright spot in, in our year when the youth group gets to do that. But again, I really want to encourage you, if you can show your support. Most importantly, we're coming back to worship God. But on top of that, it is a good way for the future of the church to be invested in. It is good for these young men to develop skills so that they can be future preachers, future song leaders. And it strengthens their faith when they have to dig into Scripture, when they have to put their own thought into how are they going to explain their faith to somebody. It does wonders for strengthening their faith. So again, we'd just like to encourage you to, to come back tonight. Uh, I'd like to thank the elders for the opportunity to speak. Um, and then, as usual, would like to say I'm not a minister. And that's okay, because this morning I don't have a sermon prepared. I want to try something a little different. I want to give a witness. I want to just tell you about some things that God has done in my life through His Word. Not for any glory about me. There's nothing good in my life except what God's Word and His will have done to my heart. But I want to share some real examples of what our loving Heavenly Father can do. And in most of these examples, I'm the bad guy. But when we get off the path, when we start to struggle, our God doesn't abandon us. His love doesn't stop. He pulls us back. Sometimes it's painful, but it's much better than the alternative. So this morning, I hope you bear with me. I hope you understand the spirit in which I'm going to share these personal things with you, um, and most importantly, I hope it glorifies our Father, because words cannot describe how good He is, His love and His kindness and His wisdom and His patience, the unspeakable patience of God. So this morning as we dive in, I'd like you to think about the parables the parables of Christ, there's, depending on how you count them and what you would consider to be a parable, there's at least 40, if not, uh, you know, 50 or 60 parables um, in just three of the Gospels. And in my mind, you kind of can break them down into, into three categories. There's parables on um, the kingdom. Christ was going to pay for his kingdom was going to establish his kingdom forever. It has no end. <clears throat> and he used parables to help break that down into little bits that we could understand. He had parables about the judgment. So just in case we missed uh, how important the kingdom was and that there's a responsibility for us to answer his, his call to, to put our faith in him, he gave us a lot of parables about what that judgment would be like. And then he gave us parables that I kind of lumped into a bigger category uh, for like one-point lessons where it talks about forgiveness or it talks about being active in the kingdom. Just one-point lessons masterfully uh, brought to life through his parables. And we're not supposed to have favorites, and I'm not saying that this next parable is my favorite, but where I'm at in my life, this parable has done the most to drive out the sin, to push me to try to do more to serve him. And that parable is the one that we read this morning, the parable of the sower. So this morning, again, I would like to 
to testify to you how these words are sharper than any two-edged sword, how these words get into your life and can cut out the bad and can encourage the good. Because you see, this parable works on so many levels. There's, there's lessons here about how important it is to have ministers, and I'm thankful for the ministers that we have here at this congregation that are spreading the seeds of the kingdom. But this parable is also about your heart, about the condition of your heart, and Christ teaches us that through gardening. I don't like to garden. I had to do it some as a, as a kid, didn't enjoy, didn't enjoy it at all. Now that could be because I don't particularly care for vegetables. You probably could have guessed that. But I was like, we're doing all this work to get like a tomato? I don't like tomatoes. But I'm thankful that I got to experience that because it helped this lesson drive home so much more clearly. And I, at first I took this parable as these are just kind of people. This is your ultimate uh, uh, fate. This is where you're going to end up. You're going to end up a person that the enemy just snatched God's word away from you. You're going to end up a person that had too many stones in your heart for God's word to really do something. You're going to end up a person who let the weeds and thorns of life choke his word from your heart. Or you're going to end up a Christian that produces fruit. But as I got a little older, I understood, like a, like a real garden, you can have a perfect garden one day. Can you stop working on that garden? Mm-mm. You can't. You can't. But we, we tried, I say we, Holly wanted to have a garden here. <clears throat> Again, not a big fan of gardens. And, and the deer, the deer are like ninjas. They get in there, they eat everything. You, we looked up all kind of stuff to try to keep them out. You cannot stop working on the garden of your heart. And so this morning, I wanna share some examples with you where I was in some of these positions, where I had some rocks in my heart, where I had a weed problem that, that was thorns were choking the, the fruit out of my life. So let's talk about that, let's dive in. So the stony ground, what, what is Christ talking about here? This is something internally. This is something that is in your heart that is not letting God's word get deep in there. God's word has to get deep inside your heart to make a change. And Christ says ultimately what happens, the Christian life is not uh, uh, an easy life. It's much better than the alternative, but the Christian life requires discipline and dedication. And he says the people that are just letting God's word kind of sit on the surface, there's something here, not letting it grow. When those trials and those tribulations come, it gets burned up. There's no fruit produced for God. I don't know what might be something you are struggling with this morning. I would bet you it's probably something on this list. Something that maybe has happened to you and it's put hardness in your heart. You know, as a kid, about the only part of gardening I liked was you have to go till up the ground. You have to go break that ground up every year. And then the part I liked was if you found rocks, you got to throw them. And that was close enough to be like a sport that that was my favorite thing, chucking them over the fence, seeing if I could outthrow my brother. <clears throat> uh, but these, these things are in our heart, and we got to get them out. So this morning, I want to tell you a very specific example in my life where I struggled with being unforgiving. And the story has to do with my mom, who I call Zilla, was Zilla's dad. I didn't refer to him as my grandfather because he wasn't. I'm thankful that I have a, a my, Zilla has a stepfather that has been a wonderful grandfather to me. And there's a whole different lesson we could do there about people that step into bad situations and are a blessing to, to people. 
if you're in one of those situations, I'm thankful for what you're doing. I was not, am not his flesh and blood, but he, was, he is an amazing grandfather to me. But Zilla's dad wasn't in my life after age probably six or seven. And let me remind you something. In this story, I'm going to tell you some of his background, some of the stuff that he struggled with, and some of the bad decisions that he made. But please hear me out. In this story, I am the bad guy. So, I'm a young kid. I don't know what it takes to make a marriage work. I have no clue what it's like to be a father. All I know is my grandmother is hurting, my mom is hurting, and this man chose not to be in our life. So no fan club for him from me. And he's gone. He's just not in our life. Now, as I got older, I learned some of the struggles that he had to go through growing up. You know, I could tell you stories that I learned later as I got older, but I think I could really sum it up for you on one thing. I never knew anybody else in his family. Nobody. Except for my great aunt Polly, who after her funeral I found out wasn't my great aunt. It was his mom. You know you're in a tough situation when you don't, the only person you know in your family is not even the the person you thought they were. So he had a lot of bad influences, a lot of obstacles to to come up against. I didn't didn't know that. It didn't matter. I honestly did not care. All I knew was how it affected my life. But no harm, no foul, right? He's not in my life. I have a great uh, step-grandfather. But Zilla continued to love him. We would be together at Thanksgiving or Christmas with her family. Everybody having a a wonderful time. Some of the most amazing memories are those family get-togethers. And Zilla would put together a plate. I love Holly's cooking. I love Zilla's cooking. If I have a last meal, I want her mom to cook it for me. This man is is giving that up, let alone the love and the fellowship and the laugh and the playing cards. He gave all that up. But Zilla wants to put a plate together for him and go over to him. Not a huge deal, but I confess to you, I didn't like it. He didn't deserve it. We didn't kick him out. He left us. I wouldn't do it. But Zilla did. Zilla still did. So, okay. Uh, You know, sometimes when we were digging rocks out of the garden, you'd find a little bitty rock. You'd be like, oh, no big deal. And then, oh, I can't get it out. You start digging. That rock was bigger and bigger and bigger. My disliking of Zilla showing kindness to somebody I thought was just a little little pebble, not a big deal. It only got bigger. Bigger he started to want to come back around before he passed away a few years ago. He wanted to be more involved. I didn't need him. I didn't want him. But because I love Zilla, sure, sure, I'll go back around and visit. My heart wasn't in it. It it was empty. It was meaningless because I wasn't doing it out of love. I was doing it out of love for Zilla, but that was it. Then, you know, his health starts to decline. And Zilla's concern is she knows the struggles he's had in his life. She knows the the falling out he's had with, with God, with going to church. And she wants to make sure he's right. I don't want to do that. Why should he get that? I I don't want to help do that. And then I was reading the parable of the unforgiving servant. 
And it just seems so awful, doesn't it? How this guy that had so much debt was begging the king for forgiveness. Please don't punish my family. Please don't punish me. You know how many times I have said that kind of prayer? And God is so good, he forgave me. And then the man goes out, and somebody owes him just a little bit. Nothing compared to what he owed the king, and no mercy, no forgiveness. I realized that was me. Didn't feel like that's right. I was still trying to be a Christian. I was still trying to do good things. I just had this one rock in my heart. But if I didn't do something about that rock, the parable of the sower tells me what would happen. So, so I had a choice. I could, I could resent Zilla for trying to be kind to somebody, for caring about the soul of her, her biological father, and I could let that rock get bigger and it could push the Word of God further and further out of my heart. Or I could let God's Word break my heart. And I want to repeat that. If you feel like there is something in your heart that is keeping you from, from growing, it's keeping God's Word from getting deeper and deeper into your heart, find Scripture to break your heart. It's not easy, it's not fun, but it's what, it's what the doctor ordered. So in that moment, I had to make the decision that this was my problem, that I needed to fix it. And I'm so thankful for Zilla's example. I'm so thankful for the Word of God, for, for teaching these parables, for, for prescribing the exact medicine that my heart needed. It needed to be broken and reset, just like that ground. You have to break that ground up to get the rocks out. That had to happen, and I, I'm thankful that I was able to be with Zilla, talking to him and, and asking if there was anything we could do and making sure he knew what God's Word said. So the story has a happy ending, and I'm so thankful to God for that because I can't imagine if I had to carry that around for the rest of my life. I carried it around for too long as it is. This morning, if one of these things are in your heart, don't resent people that are trying to help you. Don't shy away from God's word. Be broken by it so then you can be healed by his word. I'd like to talk about the seed that was sown among thorns. And yes, I can relate to this one too. It's the cares of the world. It's the, it's the material things in the world. And you think on their surface they're not bad. And you can't have a garden without some weeds in it. Maybe you have it for a day. But you have to constantly put work in to get those things out. Why? So that it looks pretty? No. Because the garden can only support so much growth. It's either going to support thorns or it's going to support godly fruit. So we got to make sure that the fruit is growing. So the, you know, you think uh, you want a career. For me, I wanted a wife. After I got the wife I, I got, I wanted kids. All of those things are good. All of those things are, are uh, uh, things that, that should help me be a Christian, but they can, if we're not careful, if we're not paying attention, they can choke the word out of our life. And that sounds crazy, but it can happen. <clears throat> so what do we do? Christ tried to tell us in the Sermon on the Mount. He talks about worrying about what you're going to eat, what clothes you're going to wear. We're so blessed to live where we do. We, we kind of take this one for granted, but he says, no, no, even if that's your top worry, it's not your top worry. Your top worry is seeking after God's righteousness. That's serious. That, that hurts. Because we have things, right? My job, I care about my career. I need it to support my family. I care about my family. I want to I take care of them and support them. He says, they're not even a close second. And we won't survive our race as a Christian if God is not the very first thing in our life. 
And it, again, it, it, it can feel weird to us, but I can give you a, a perfect example, and I've shared this in some of my classes, but, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll try to give a briefer version, but when, when we were pregnant with our first child, it didn't know if it was a boy or a girl yet, um, before, she, before she was even born, I knew, right, I wasn't going to make the mistakes my parents did. Uh, my kids were going to be uh, scholarship athletes, and thankfully taken after Holly, they could be uh, straight-A students, and, you know, all this stuff. It's like they say, the best parents are people that don't have children. Y'all know, know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to let my kids, you know, be on the phone, and then you have a kid screaming on a car ride, and you're like, it won't hurt just a little bit. But I had all these great plans in my mind of how my kids were going, going to be. And I think it was half uh, a sincere trying to be a, a, a good father, and I think the other half of it was, was pride, was caring about what the world thought. I didn't want the world to think I was a bad father. And then we had a scare, and we thought, we lost our baby. And I realized she was never mine to begin with. She was God's. They're just on loan. And I realized that had to be my top priority was serving God first. Never felt more helpless in my life. Knowing something you cared about so much you couldn't, you couldn't do anything about. You couldn't bargain. You couldn't pay enough money, you couldn't work hard enough, you couldn't be strong enough. But God said no. Before she was even formed in the womb, I knew her. And she's going back to him. And I can never let anything, no matter how good it may seem or how good it may make me feel, I can never let anything take my focus off of putting God first. And then... I started to see this, this does make sense. If you get focused, if you think, okay, I will put four hours a week into God. I'll be here at the building for four hours a week. And then outside of that, I gotta take care of my job. I gotta take care of my house. I gotta take care of my kids, my parents, whatever obligations you have, you're not gonna have the fruit that God wants you to have. I know that. It started creeping up in, in my life. And you struggle with it. And through God's word, through thinking about putting him first, the thing that has helped me the most fight against that and be able to focus to make sure I'm trying to produce these fruits of the Spirit is i got to focus on the fruits of the Spirit. And then that sounds really simple, but hear me out. When I go to work, I care about my job. I care about doing what my boss wants. I care about the company being successful. But I had to learn more important than that. I had to learn about being a Christian at work. I had to learn to let my fruit be there. Because I spend way more time at the office than I do at the church building. I got to let my fruit be there. I got to think the most important thing is that I am honest, that I don't complain all the time at work. The Bible tells us not to grumble, not to complain. We think that's just about sermons or, uh, you, you know, the, the food that was fixed or something like that. He's talking about in all of our life. I have to use what could be a thorn, what could be a distraction, what could be taking away from God's fruit in my life and say, no, I'm going to let this be an exercise. This is a new plot of land where I want more fruit to grow for God. Same thing with the kids. Love them to death. Want them to be successful. Can get caught up in things like their schooling, their sports. And I still have to put effort into that. But I had to change my thought process. I had to say, I don't care if you play a sport. I don't care if you go to college. When compared to the fact that I care if you are a Christian, if you are the person God wants you to be, nothing else matters. And I had to make it that drastic because those thorns, I mean, you've seen what happened, right? We, uh, we had a, you, you leave a garden 
alone, say you go on vacation for a week and you come back and it looks like a jungle. If we take our focus off of producing fruit for God, that is what will happen to us. And we won't bring any fruits to maturity. Again, it can be a painful lesson to learn and not that I have perfected it. You know, work, work can get busy, kids can have struggles with something and, and you start to take your eye off of that ball. We have to focus on those fruits. We have to make sure they're in our life. We can't, we can't remove the weeds completely. We have obligations in life, but we got to put the focus on God first. So I want to encourage you to do better than I have done, but to, to have that mentality. Now, the, the good soil, not a lot to say on this one. This is where we all want to be. But what we need to do to make sure we're there is take an honest look at your life. Are these things in your life and do they abound? You don't have to answer to me. You don't even have to answer to the elders unless you start messing with the, the message of the church here. But you have to answer to God. If these things aren't in your life, then you probably have a thorn or a stone problem. You have rocks that are in your heart, something that's preventing you from growing. And if you're in this group, then praise God and, and keep on doing. My, my call for you there, something that, that I'm working on and trying to do, and this could go for the thorns and the, the stones as well, but find somebody to look up to. If you're producing fruit 30-fold, you probably don't have to look too far around this room to find some people that are producing 60-fold, 100-fold. Not that we put them on a pedestal, not that we call them a saint. No, Christ makes you a saint when you accept his forgiveness, when you obey the gospel. But this is a biblical principle. Paul told the church at Corinth, imitate me as I'm trying to imitate Christ. The Hebrew writer gave us an example of all the Old Testament people that had done so much for God. And then he's in chapter 11 and then in chapter 12 he says, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, it's supposed to help us. I, I'll give you an example. Uh, in, not, not in Christianity, but <clears throat> kids today, if you watch them play sports, if you go to a, a, a junior high game or a high school game, you know what 90% of the quarterbacks look like? The way they play, they don't play like Dan Marino or Peyton Manning. They're playing like Patrick Mahomes. They're running and trying to sidearm the stuff and throwing the ball behind their back. They're imitating somebody that they have seen do something successful. It helps give them a picture of you can really do this. Whatever age you are at, whatever stage you're at in life, there can be somebody that can be a positive influence on you to say, I can juggle a family and career and still be active in the church. I can be in poor health, but continue to focus on people, continue to be a caring and loving person. And in my own life, I know me and dad have the same person that has helped influence us, his father. His father has passed away now for over a decade, but still the highest compliment we say to each other is, that's something your papa would be pleased with. The man had that kind of example, set that kind of example, his love for God, his dedication to it, where a decade after he's gone, his grandson is saying, I want to follow in his footsteps. I want to do that same example that he did. He did it. I can do it. It gives us a, a, a pattern. It helps us. He wasn't a perfect man, but think about that example. That's what I would love to have one day where after I'm gone, even my kids and my grandkids say, I wanna, I wanna follow his example. I wanna be helped by the way he lived. He was so quiet, but it wasn't like he was disengaged, he was listening. And I try to do that, and, and when I get nervous, I'll talk too much. But around family, I, I try to be quiet and listen, because that's what he did and it changes that interaction. I get so much more out of it instead of me telling people about what I'm doing or how things are going for me, I listen to them. Just one of the examples of where somebody can do something and you think, 
I didn't even think about that. I didn't even think about throwing the ball behind my back. I didn't even think about side arming it or running around and doing a 360 and then throwing it. There are people in this congregation, and I'm not going to name names or do anything like that, but that are inspiring, have lived through difficulties, have lived through trials and struggles and keep their faith sincere and strong and a, and a, a shining example. There are people here that you think, oh, well, they've made it to retirement. It's time to just kick up your feet and take it easy. And they're doing more uh, for the Lord than, than ever. They're passionate about a mission work and, 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 a, and a ministry, and they're, they're doing so much. There are people here that are, are at every activity that happens. It's like the example with Zilla. You can be bitter about that. You can be resentful and say, well, you know, it, it, they've got it easier than I do somehow. Or, or you can be inspired by it. And I want to encourage you the, from the impact that my grandfather has had on my life to be somebody that inspires. Find somebody that can inspire you, that can help you take your game to the next level as a Christian. Finally, this morning, you knew we had to talk about it, the seeds that are on the wayside. This morning, if, if that's you, if you've been in countless worship services, you've heard the Word of God preached, and you are just praying that you can get out of this, that you'll be old enough and you won't have to come anymore, and you don't have to listen to this, you don't have to have that bad feeling in your stomach, you are praying for the devil to snatch that seed out of your heart, to take away your only hope of salvation. Don't make that mistake. My life is not perfect. I will continue to fall short, but I, I shudder to even think of what my life would be like without God's Word in it. And this morning, if you're sitting there and you're, you're compelled, but you're just fighting against it, you don't want to give in. It is like sands, sand in an hourglass. Because God says if you don't accept His Word, three of the four soils accepted His Word. And he says, if you don't accept it, if you let it just keep sitting there, but your heart is too hard, the devil's going to snatch it away. The devil's going to say, show up, but don't listen. The devil's going to say, as soon as you're 18, you don't have to go to service anymore. He is your enemy. He doesn't want God to, to do with your life what he wants to and to bring him glory and honor. So this morning, maybe that's not you but if you're old enough to understand what I'm saying, just like me, we are in one of these four places. Our heart is in one of these four conditions. You don't have to answer to me, but we don't know when our time is up. And God loved us so much, and he's doing so much to help us live for him that if you, if you have a need, the answer is the cross. And you can come forward and talk to one of our elders or one of our ministers and look for scripture that will break your heart so that you can get whatever's holding God's word back out of your heart. You can ask for prayers to say, I'm focusing too much on things that aren't producing fruit. Or you can say, I want to be more on fire for the Lord. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. Don't leave today without feeling like the garden of your heart is in a good state. Whatever your need this morning is, if you'd let us know while we stand and sing.